Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 23. We will be revisiting the text that we were in last week, verses 44 down through 46 is what we will be reading. Primarily, we'll stay in verse 45 this morning. Luke chapter 23, we're going to read, beginning in verse 44, down through verse 46. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, He gave up his spirit. Heavenly Father, as we come to the preaching of your word, we fix our eyes on your ways and we commit to meditate on all of your precepts. Would you bind your word upon our hearts that we might never forget your truth? Give us insight. Give me clarity in speech. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The heart of the death of Jesus Christ is the idea of a substitution. This is plain as Luke unpacks for us this moment, historically significant, yes, eternally significant, even more so, of Jesus in his death on the cross. A sinless Savior stood in the place of sinful people, took the penalty for their sin and cleansed them through his blood. And through his death, Jesus purchased for God a people who once were enslaved in the bondage of sin, redeeming them from the curse of sin. And Luke has depicted this wrath-bearing sacrifice of Jesus in the darkness that covered the land, verse 44 describes. For the space of three hours in the middle of the day, a supernatural occurrence displaying and representing God's wrath against sin. God's wrath had been stored up and was now being poured out on Jesus in full measure as an eternal satisfaction for the sins of all those who would believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. This corresponds, this darkness that encompasses the land in verse 44, corresponds to the spiritual realities we discussed last week. Propitiation and expiation, the two theological terms that represent the wrath-bearing sacrifice of Christ and the cleansing and forgiveness of our sins. We've sought to answer this question more than just the historical nature of the death of Jesus, but what is it that Jesus' death accomplished? What are the spiritual realities that took place on this day so many years ago on this hill called Golgotha? This morning, we're going to consider one more spiritual reality that was accomplished in the death of Christ Symbolized for us in verse verse 45 as the tearing of the veil in the temple. And that's this spirituality. Jesus' death accomplished reconciliation between God and man. Jesus' death accomplished reconciliation between God and man. The wrath-absorbing sacrifice of Jesus was indeed necessary for reconciliation to come about. Man wasn't just enslaved to sin from which he needed to be redeemed, but man also is at enmity with God for which he needs to be reconciled. Man's alienation from God is evident throughout the scriptures, and we recognize that it began at the beginning in Genesis chapter 3 when Before that, God had created his perfect world, and man existed with God in perfect harmony and fellowship, perfectly at peace with God, fellowshipping with him as he was created 
to be communing with him daily. But then sin entered the world, and we know everything changed because of that. That peace that existed between the creator and the creature was broken, and hostility took its place. Man was alienated and hostile to God. But it wasn't just man that was hostile to God or opposed to God. God also was angry with man's sin and man because of his disobedience. An anger which we realized last week needed to be satisfied by the death of Christ. But it's this unreconciled state, this alienation from the Creator, that after Genesis 3 became the normal condition of mankind, born into the world, born an enemy of God, unreconciled to the Creator. The reason that Jesus had to come and die was because of this state that we existed in. Reconciliation, as I mentioned, is depicted by Luke in verse 45 as the rending of the veil in the temple, this curtain. And these spiritual realities we talk about, reconciliation and propitiation and expiation, they're not ideas that we made up to try to explain the death of Jesus. They come from the text. They come from Scripture itself. In fact, all three of what we call the synoptic gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of them mention this event at the death of Jesus. That the, temp- that the curtain that was in the temple tore in half, and Matthew writes that it happened from top to bottom. And Matthew and Mark, they put the event occurring after Jesus breathes his last, after he dies, it is finished, and he dies, and the veil tears in two. Luke actually puts it before he breathes his last, as verse 46 tells us. He still says, into your hands I commit my spirit, and then he breathes his last. And I think Luke is arranging the events in this particular order so that we see it side by side with the other accomplishment of Christ in the wrath-bearing sacrifice of Jesus that he's represented in the darkness. He wants us to see them, these two uh, symbols of what Christ has accomplished side by side. And so he puts it here so that it would be evident to us that there is something very significant that has taken place in the death of Christ. Now this curtain that is mentioned in verse 45 is the curtain in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. You remember from our sermon last week. The Holy of Holies was that room in the temple that was designated as the place where God would have his presence dwell. It had the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant that represented God's presence on earth. And that was the place that was off limits to every sinful person, which meant everyone. There was one man selected by God once a year to enter the Holy of Holies. That was the high priest. And he could go in only after, uh, only when he brought in a sacrifice for his own sins, and then he would sacrifice for the sins of the people. And that only happened one time of year because the presence of a holy God was unsafe for a sinful man. The people could not approach God in their sinfulness because he is so holy. There's a striking illustration in 2 Samuel chapter 6 of the absolute, utter, terrifying holiness of God. This Ark of the Covenant was originally put into a tabernacle before the temple was made as a permanent place. And so it was a place that was made, a tabernacle, where it could move along with the people. And the Ark of the Covenant was in a similar uh, way. And so the children of Israel would take the Ark and move it to different locations. and when King David, when David became king, he decided he wanted the Ark of the Covenant to go to Jerusalem. And so he gathered a bunch of people to take it from the city that it was in and take it to Jerusalem in this long procession. They put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart pulled by oxen, which incidentally was contrary to the way God had prescribed that the Ark would be transported. But as it goes along the road, the oxen stumble and the Ark begins to tip off of the cart. There's a man named Yuza that's standing beside 
the card at that moment. And he reaches out his hand to study the Ark of the Covenant. And as soon as he touches it, God's anger boils against Uzzah and he strikes him dead on the spot. And you say, boy, that sounds a little harsh. Wasn't he just trying to help? The sinful man cannot come into contact with that which is holy. That's the presence, the manifest presence of the holy God. This is dangerous for humanity to be in the presence of the holy God in their sinfulness. In fact, that was a terrifying moment for the children of Israel. David was so terrified by the holiness of God, he said, forget it. I don't want that ark in Jerusalem. Leave it somewhere else for now. He was terrified. And so should sinful man be when they encounter the holiness of God. You see how far we've come from Adam and Eve in the garden and fellowship with God to the Holy God being terrified. The Westminster Shorter Catechism summarizes the chief end of man, summarizes the scriptures teaching on the chief end of man and says it's this, the chief man of an, end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Does that strike you as a little odd? Does that strike you? How can you enjoy a God this holy? In your sinfulness, how in the world Can you have a relationship with a God who merely by your touching in sinfulness, an object that represents his holy presence would kill you? How can one have fellowship with such a God? How can one enjoy such a God forever? Well, the answer to the restoration of that relationship between a holy God and sinful man is the man, Jesus Christ. He's the answer to that. And it's in his death where man can be reconciled back to God and God can be reconciled to man. Jesus, in his death, would open the door of access to the presence of God. That veil that kept man from going into the presence of God would be torn into representing and symbolizing that access is now open to the presence of God through Jesus Christ. An astonishing reality. What amazing grace. Reconciliation made available by Jesus who became our high priest. You remember that day of atonement in Leviticus chapter 16 that we said that high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would carry a sin offering for the people sacrificing them, the the goat, the sin offering, to atone for the people. And then he would take his hands and lay them on the head of a second goat, transferring the sins of the people to that goat and would send it off in the wilderness as the scapegoat. And what we said last week is that Jesus served as both the sacrifice that would atone for sins and the scapegoat that would carry the sins of the people away. But Hebrews tells us that that isn't the only way that Jesus served. He also served as the greater high priest, the one who could enter into the presence of God to offer the sacrifice necessary. And it was this service as the great high priest that accomplished this reconciliation that we have with God. And this morning, my goal in the rest of our time together is to dig into this high priestly ministry just a little bit more. And see what it was about Jesus' ministry that accomplished that reconciliation that we have with God. This morning we have the privilege of celebrating communion together. An observance that reminds us of this fellowship that we have with God. This reconciliation that has taken place through Jesus Christ. So in view of that, I want to look at two features of the great high priestly ministry of Jesus that accomplished our redemption. Two features of the great high priestly ministry of Jesus that accomplished our, excuse me, not our redemption, our reconciliation with God. First, in his death, Jesus serves as our mediator before God. Jesus serves as our mediator, one who would represent us before God. This was the role that the priests were given in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant. They were given this role to mediate between God and 
the nation of Israel. And they would go into the presence of God to represent the nation of Israel before God and be a mediator. Intercede for the people. A mediator is one who goes between two warring parties in order to bring peace between them. You might be familiar with some kind of mediation. Two people can agree in conflict. A mediator comes and brings peace. And the line of the high priest from Aaron on served in this capacity in the temple worship. But with all the people that came and all the many priests and many high priests that served even after Aaron, there was no one among them who could actually intercede perfectly before the Father. That's why these sacrifices, we said, had to be repeated over and over again. There was only one who could do that. Jesus Christ, the righteous. In fact, this is what Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Listen to what he declares. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus Christ. Only one could bridge the gap that existed. Only one could bring peace to two warring parties. And that was Jesus Christ. His sacrifice removed the barrier that existed between God and man. The barrier of sin. God proved that he accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for sin when he rose him from the dead. And he raised him. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22 says this. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind. So listen to the description of that. You and I, right? Once alienated from who? From God. And hostile in mind. Doing evil deeds. He, Jesus, has now reconciled in his body by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. He interceded before the Father and he did it perfectly. Now, when Jesus was on the cross, we know that he did not physically get down from the cross, enter into the physical temple, open the curtain, offer sacrifice to the Holy of Holies. And that's not what he did. So how did he do it? Well, Hebrews tells us that he went into the very presence of God in the heavenly tabernacle to offer his sacrifice. The earthly tabernacle, the earthly temple was a copy of the heavenly tabernacle where God dwells. Not just manifest on earth, but his very presence dwells. And Jesus entered into that heavenly tabernacle with his sinless sacrifice and offered it to the Lord for the sins of the people. That's why his ministry as mediator exceeded all of the other Israelite priests. They could only come into the earthly tabernacle, and even that once a year. But Jesus went into the heavenly tabernacle, bringing a better covenant than the one that had been established. And through the sacrifice, Jesus brought peace where there was once hostility. This is part of Paul's point in Ephesians chapter 2. As he's writing to the church at Ephesus, he is explaining to them that they have unity and peace with each other because of the death of Jesus, accomplished first because he has brought peace between them and God. And here's the argument of Paul. You have peace horizontally because first you have peace vertically. And that's the reason you can have peace with other people because first Christ has brought peace with you and God. He tells the Gentiles at one point they were alienated from God and away from the hopes of promises. But now he says, in Christ Jesus, who you, you who are far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It's the blood of Christ, he says, that reconciles us to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Reconciliation, a relationship established with God because of our mediator. You know, of all the descriptions of the atonement, we could talk about how he is a wrath-bearing sacrifice and he cleanses us of our sins and he buys us back out of slavery. Reconciliation is the, the one with the personal nature to it. 
He brings us into a relationship with the God of the universe. Christ's work as mediator ensures that we will never, ever be lost if we have trusted in Christ. It secures an eternal redemption. That's why we say what's happening here in Luke 23, 44, and 45 is not just something that happened 2,000 years ago, but it has spiritual realities and ramifications that go all the way into eternity. And Jesus' work as our intercessor secures for us an eternal redemption that continues even today. In the book of Hebrews, that contrasts the Israelite priests with the superior ministry of Jesus Christ, argues this way. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in the office. Essentially, they could serve temporarily. Why? Because they would die. And they could serve no longer as the high priest. But he, meaning Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. And Jesus has not stopped his mediation work for us. Did you realize that? It didn't just happen on the cross. He continues that today. And on what basis does he mediate before God? On the basis of the sacrifice that he made. You know, I've covered that one with my blood. I've forgiven her sins. She is mine. I've purchased him. They are mine. He intercedes before the throne of the Father even now. So we are secure in our redemption. It's eternal because Christ in his work continues, which is why we have promises like this. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, 1 John 2, 1. Or 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? Because Christ intercedes for us. The promise we have in reconciliation. God has brought two warring parties together. Now, unless we get out of balance, when we talk about Christ's anger being appeased, or God's anger being appeased, and God being reconciled to man, we don't need to think of this as God as some kind of capricious, vindictive deity that has to have his arm twisted by Christ in order to get into a relationship with his creatures. If Luke has shown us anything, he has shown us that this is the fulfillment of the plan of the Father. That this event, this crucifixion that has such spiritual ramifications to it, is actually the unfolding of the will of God. In love, he sent his Son to be the mediator, the propitiation for our sins. And this great high priest has accomplished reconciliation through his death as mediator. But there's a second feature that I want to bring to your attention that accomplishes reconciliation. A second feature of Christ's high priestly ministry, and it's this, that Christ served as our righteousness. Christ served as our righteousness. Not just our mediator before the Father, but our own righteousness he served as. We've seen how for Luke, it is extremely important that we understand that Jesus was sinless when he died on the cross. Over and over again. If you've been with us in this study, you've seen how Luke has labored to show us the innocence of Jesus Christ on the cross. Why is that so important? Why is that so significant? Well, that's because an imperfect sacrifice could never accomplish reconciliation. It could never accomplish reconciliation. Not only because a sinless sacrifice was necessary to assuage God's wrath, but also because the righteousness we needed could only be supplied by a sinless Savior. The righteousness we needed could only be supplied by a sinless Savior. See, 
the Israelites already had their own sinful high priests that were offering sacrifices. That was part of the problem. They had to offer sacrifice themselves first before they could offer it for the people. But Jesus was superior as a high priest precisely because he was righteous, sinless, and didn't have to offer, when he went before the presence of God, didn't have to offer sacrifice for his own sins first before he'd offer them for the people. That's why he was greater. That's why it was only his sinless life that qualified him to be the sacrifice to bring reconciliation between God and man. The sinless, righteous life is important. Why? If Jesus had sinned one time in his life, if Jesus had ever had a wayward thought or a stray desire, reconciliation with the Holy God is impossible. Impossible. But thanks be to God, Jesus fulfilled the requirements of the law perfectly. He maintained perfect allegiance to the Father, and by doing so, He opened the avenue of peace to be made with God. The curtain torn in two. In order to be brought into fellowship with God, we needed righteousness. A characteristic that I think you would agree with me, we obviously lack. It doesn't take long for us to observe humankind, observe ourselves, observe our neighbor before we realize we lack righteousness of our own. And Jesus bore the wrath of God for our sins, cleansed us, and forgave us for our sins. But if that's all the death of Christ did, then we would not be reconciled with the Father because we are not righteous. We are not holy. See, it's not just the absence of sin that is necessary to be in the presence of a holy God, but the presence of righteousness. That is necessary for us to have a relationship with God. Now think of it this way. When Christ died for our sins, and we, by faith, have come to Jesus Christ. He cleanses us from our sins. In other words, he removes all the sin from our bank account. You could say it that way. So that our bank account now is at a zero sum. And that's a lot of mercy. It's a marvelous amount of mercy. The penalty for that sin is gone. Sin is cleansed. That spiritual bank account now, as God considers it, is empty of that sin that would hold, that would be against us, that would bring the penalty upon us. But that's not enough for peace with God. That bank account also has to be filled with righteousness. It has to be filled with righteousness. And you can try to do it on your own. You could try to put in your own righteousness into that bank account and say, okay, well, God, here it is. Here's my righteousness. Here's the good things I've done. Here's the deeds I have worked on. But that righteousness will not suffice. All we will ever do is fill that bank account up with more sin. That's all we can ever do in our own efforts and by our own efforts. The prophet Isaiah makes this graphically obvious. In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, he paints the picture of how God sees us in our own righteousness. And here's what he says. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Now, that translation, polluted garment, is kind of a, a softening even of the word, the Hebrew word that is used, because the Hebrew word here is for a menstrual cloth. That, that is the polluted garment that he's talking about here. And it's intended to be graphic and shocking to say that he sees our righteous deeds like a menstrual cloth. Filthy. Our righteousness proves to be woefully lacking. And the depths of our sinfulness is frankly something we don't even completely realize ourselves. That's why we need someone else's righteousness. Someone outside of us. A righteousness that is not our own. We need the righteousness of Jesus to be placed upon us. To be imputed to us. 
Without that righteousness, we don't have reconciliation. We have no hope of that relationship if we don't have the righteousness of Jesus Christ upon us. But praise be to God, Jesus provides us with such righteousness. And he accomplished it in his death. The exchange, the exchange is, is very breathtaking. It's, it's very startling. Jesus takes our sins, and we get his righteousness. You say, that's not fair. You're right, but it's grace. And that's the whole idea of grace. It's something you don't deserve. His righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 sums it up. For our sake, he made him who to be sin, who knew no sin. He made him to be sin, who knew no sin. Sinless, taking on my sin and your sin. Why? So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. What an exchange. In his mercy, Jesus reconciles us to God by serving as our righteousness. Listen, this righteousness that we so desperately need but do not have of our own comes to us in the same way that forgiveness of sins comes to us, and that's by faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way that this grace will flow to you. This righteousness becomes yours By faith in Jesus Christ. By entrusting yourself to him. Not just believing that Jesus existed at some point in time that he died on a cross. Not even just believing the historical facts that he rose again from the dead. But by entrusting yourself to him as the only answer to your sin problem. As long as you trust in your own righteousness. As long as you assume that what you do is good enough, you will never attain reconciliation with God. The avenue into the presence of God will remain closed to you. Unless you avail yourself of what Jesus has done. Because when you stand before a holy God, you need an advocate. You can't stand on your own. You need someone else to stand with you interceding for you, being your mediator before God. That's what you need. You need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, frankly, by all accounts, one of the greatest Christians to ever live, missionary to the Gentiles, dedicating his life to serving God, had a long list of accomplishments of righteousness accumulated in his life. And at one point in his life, he banked on that to get him uh, into favor with God. But one day God opened his eyes to the truth. And he saw his sinfulness, and he saw his need for a Savior and for righteousness that wasn't his own. And he left behind all of his accomplishments for the sake of Christ. This is his testimony in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having, he says, a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, In other words, not banking on the righteousness I can do that comes from obedience and all the good works I can have. Not counting on that, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness of God that depends on faith. The Apostle Paul looked at all the accomplishments that he had and all the ways that he could have earned righteousness and he left it all behind, counting them as nothing but garbage and being found only in Christ. That's where his hope rested. And that's true of anyone that wants to be reconciled to God. I don't care how good you are. Mother Teresa needed to be reconciled to God by having faith in Jesus Christ 
no matter how many works you did. Everyone, everywhere, must put their faith in Christ alone or they will not be reconciled to the holy God. If you come to God with your hands full of your achievements, believe somehow God's going to be impressed by that, you've lost your way. He's not impressed by all the good things you've done. When you come to God, you must come empty-handed, asking Him to accept you not on your merits, but on the merits of Jesus Christ. And that alone. And He promises that if you come to Him by faith, He sets aside the hostility. He makes peace with you. He adopts you into His family. So listen, if you're not reconciled to God today, God has opened, Christ has opened the way for God. The curtain has been torn and access to God is granted, but you have to come through the way God has prescribed. And that's through Jesus Christ. Any other way will not result in reconciliation. But when you do come, when you are accepted by God, Christian, you can give testimony to this. You have a steadfast hope that will never be shaken, don't you? You have a steadfast anchor for your souls in the reconciliation that Christ has accomplished for us. Nothing in this life can take it away from you. And you can have, that's why, uh, that's why some Christians are fond of saying, no Christian has a bad day. Why? Because at the end of that day, you're still a child of God. And that's the best news that could ever be given to you. You're still reconciled with the Creator. That's an unshakable foundation in hope. That takes us through every trial, even death. The greatest trial we will face, death. This is our unshakable foundation. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. We have a steadfast hope, church, an anchor for our soul in the work of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, I think as Christians, we tend to neglect the treasure we've been given, access to the heavenly throne room, communion and fellowship with the Creator. We don't commune with God, not like we should. How do we commune with God? Well, we commune with God by spending time in His Word and by prayer. God talks to us through His Word, and we talk to Him through prayer. It's fellowship, it's relationship. But we neglect it all too often, don't we? We don't treasure the relationship that Christ gave His life for us to have. We neglect it. We set it aside for other things that we deem to be more important. We're not even like the Israelites under the Old Covenant who couldn't even go into the manifest presence of God. They they had to stay in the outer court and give their sacrifices and, and, and stay back. We have access to the very throne room of God. Anytime we want it, Jesus ushers us into the presence of Almighty God. We have to make full use of the reconciliation we've been given by Christ with the Father. But all these benefits that you have received as a Christ follower were never meant for you to keep to yourself. There's all kinds of benefits that come with being reconciled to the Creator. And you and I have an unshakable foundation. We can walk around the day rejoicing that our payment has been fulfilled. We get to have a relationship with God because we are before Him as holy and righteous and we certainly should rejoice in that. But that's not where it was meant to stay. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, as Paul speaks of this reconciliation that we have with God, he also says that Christ has commissioned those He has reconciled to be His ambassadors and carry this message of reconciliation to a world that desperately needs to hear it. This is what he says. 
All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself <coughs> and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, he says, we are ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors, representatives of Christ in this world. As God is making his appeal through us, Paul says, we implore you on behalf of of Christ to be reconciled to God. This is the message, Christians, we have. Uh, Frankly, this is the message that we will stand before God accountable for. Not not just me, certainly me. Certainly me. I'll stand before God accountable for this message. Did, Did it get proclaimed? Was the message of reconciliation clear? I will stand accountable, but you will too. Because every reconciled person is also an ambassador. And this is the message you have to declare to a world that needs to hear it. And it's not dependent on whether the world wants to hear it. It's not dependent on that. It's not dependent on whether the world will receive it from you. None of that is your responsibility. Yours is to declare the message of reconciliation that Christ died, bore the sins of the people is willing to forgive you of all of your sins and reconcile you back to God if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and turn away from everything you have hoped in already to this point. The message of reconciliation is the privilege we have before our Father. We celebrate the Lord's table this morning as a timely reminder of our fellowship with God in Christ. This is a time for us that as a church body, we we are reminded of these very truths. We have gotten some heavy doses of theology and doctrine the past two weeks. All about the death of Christ. The wrath-bearing sacrifice of Christ. The forgiveness we have been granted in Christ. The reconciliation that has been ours in Christ. And it's these truths that should fill our minds even now as we prepare to take the Lord's table together. This practice of the Lord's Supper was instituted by Jesus himself. And it was meant for us to grow in our understanding and appreciation of the sacrifice of Christ. And if you're not reconciled to God this morning, This observance, what we do here, really does nothing for you because you're outside of Christ. I said a moment earlier that the only way that you come to be reconciled with God is by faith. It doesn't come through eating bread and drinking a cup of juice. It it doesn't come through that. You cannot be reconciled by God simply by taking this. There's nothing magical in what we do. There's nothing mystical. There's everything about remembering the death of Christ. So I don't want you to be confused about that. And so what I'm going to ask you is if you're not in Christ, just let that plate pass by as it comes. And don't, don't partake of it. Just simply watch. Because I don't want you to be confused into thinking that this somehow will save you. Faith alone saves you. But while... While we're asking you not to partake, I don't want you to ignore what's taking place here. Don't ignore it. Pay attention to what's happening. Because what's going on here is a visible picture of what the Bible teaches about the death of Christ. The bread that we take represents the body of Jesus broken for our sins on the cross. The cup that we drink represents the blood of of Jesus that was spilled to cover our transgressions and to atone for them. So pay attention to what's going on and see it as we partake of this. And listen, I'm going to invite you, if you don't know Christ, if you have any questions about what we do in this time or even about what we talked about in the message or sang about in the songs, come find me. Come find Pastor Micah. 
come find Ryan that led our music. All of us, any of us, would love to have a conversation with you about this. But if you are part of God's family and good standing with God's church, we invite you to participate with us. Eagerly and wholeheartedly partake of this supper. It's an expression of our unity as the body of Christ. The peace that Jesus purchased for us between man and God, the reconciliation that happened there is intended to now flow out in reconciliation with other people in the body. So so when we celebrate this, we're also reminding ourselves of the unity that we have because of the death of Christ. The peace that was accomplished even among ourselves. And it's for that reason that, that I'm going to recommend that if you have something against another brother or sister in Christ, you need to make it right. You need to deal with that. You need to address that issue, not just in your heart, but let me commend you that if you do have something against another brother or sister in Christ, even here in this body, that you just take a few moments and maybe talk to the person and and commit with them to deal with these issues later on after the service. I I know that a two-minute conversation is probably not going to give you enough time to unravel the things that need to be unraveled, but make a commitment with them that you're not going to let this stand between you guys. This is a perfect opportunity for that before you partake of the Lord's Supper. So in light of that, I'm going to give us a few minutes of silent prayer. It's a time for reflection, a time for worship, where you might pray and thank God for the sacrifice of Christ. If there's sins that you might need to confess, to make it right with God, do that. And his promise is, if you confess He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And you lay hold of that promise as you confess the sins that you have. Don't let your sin stand in the way of your fellowship with God in this important time. So take a few minutes, and after that is done, I'm going to ask the deacons after that to come forward to pass out the elements. So take a few minutes of time, if you would. Go and ask the deacons if you would come forward. As they pass out these elements to you, 
if you wish to partake, there are, go ahead, gentlemen, you can go ahead and start passing them out. If you wish to partake, <coughs> there are two cups that are stacked on top of each other. Just go ahead and take both of them. The top one has the juice and the bottom one has the bread in it. Scripture says to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 and 24, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. (laughs) 
25 continues. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Let's pray together. Father, it's hard to find words to express the gratitude in our hearts. For Jesus Christ, the righteous, our mediator. Father, your grace is astounding. And we want to reap the benefits, the full benefits of reconciliation with you. But Father, we don't want to just keep that to ourselves. We want the world to know the grace that is available through Jesus Christ. So I pray that you would send us on our way this morning with full hearts, ready to serve as ambassadors and minister your grace wherever we go. Father, I ask that if there's anyone here that is not reconciled to you, Father, through the proclamation of your truth, your spirit would use that to help them see their sin and their need for Christ and to cry out to God, to you, for their salvation. We ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus Christ.